Um, so uh, this morning we spent a lot of time talking about pathway enrichment analysis, and um, uh, this just reviews what we saw this morning, um, which uh, you guys know about. And the sort of typical way that you visualize the results of this is, is, is as a table. Um, obviously, pathway enrichment analysis is very useful. Tens of thousands of papers have used it. But the, the way that almost everybody views the results as this table is not the nicest way of, of seeing it, uh, the results, because one of the things that um, you find if you go through these lists is that there's a lot of pathway names that are related to each other, but they're spread out all over the list. And so if you want to see the general themes, there's, there's some redundancy. So for instance, if I go through this list, there's pathways, a lot of pathways related to the immune system. Um, but some of them are, if you weren't you know, immunologist, you might not, or if you didn't learn immunology, you might not know that all of them were related to the immune system. Um, so not all of them say immune in them, for instance. So, um, but they, you know, there probably is an immune theme here, um, but it's not easy to, to tell. And so you'd have to kind of go up and down this list. So what we've done um, with uh, the enrichment map is we took the network concept that I just talked to you about, and we're visualizing the results of the enrichment analysis as a network. And why would we do that? Because we can see the relationships between the pathways, and we can see patterns in that that we would otherwise be hard to see as a table, as I explained before. So, um, you know, as you as you guys learned this morning uh, or earlier, um, you know, you could use GSEA to get your uh, pathways are enriched in. Uh, you know, condition A versus B and B versus A. So this is the upregulated guys and this is the downregulated guys. And um, so what an, an enrichment map does is it takes each gene set or pathway, visual, visualizes it as a node or a circle. Um, the lines connecting the, the circle, the size of the circle is proportional to the number of genes in the gene set or in the pathway. The color of the, of the circle is, is proportional to the significance score. Um, so the stronger the color, the more significant. Um, Upregulated is red, downregulated is blue. Um, the edges connect nodes. Um, the lines connect the circles if there's crosstalk among the pathways or if the pathways share genes, if they have genes in common. So um, you might see this if you have uh, multiple versions of the pathway from different databases. So many databases will have a pathway called cell cycle. So you'll see all of them coming back and all be highly related to each other. Um, okay, so I'll go through how this uh, um, sort of some, some use cases. Uh, so we, in the original paper for this, uh, found a, gene ex a publicly available gene expression data set where they looked at estrogen treatment of breast cancer cell lines. So they were looking at a particular time point um, and they had three replicates of uh, treated and three replicates of untreated. And uh, we use the gene ontology biological process to, or gene ontology in general, to um, do the pathway analysis in this case. So the, the differential expression compares treated versus untreated. Uh, and this is the enrichment map that, that results. So um, as I said, all the nodes are pathways. Um, and instead of seeing, so you can sort of see in the zoom in, they have names uh, like microtubule organizing center, um, Sorry, let me get my mouse pointer. Microtubule organizing center, uh, microtubule cytoskeleton organization and biogenesis, centrosome. So all of these are related, and we put them into a theme called microtubule cytoskeleton. So you'll see very quickly there are major themes that come up. So each of these circles here, so the, 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 the standard enrichment map view, I should actually show it, um, doesn't have the circles and the labels. Um, Normally, you just get the, the, the red and the blue nodes and the green lines. Um, and then afterwards, we add the circles and the labels. And we had to used to do that manually, but now we have a, t a tool called Auto Annotate, and it does it all for you. Um, at a, and you still have to edit it to make it publication quality, but it definitely helps speed things up. So this is a bunch of pathways related to translation. Um, and here's some pathways related to tight junctions. So you can quickly see what's going up and what's going down. So that's what I like. This, this visualization helps you get a very quick overview of the data set. Um, and uh, from that overview, you can hopefully identify things that are interesting to zoom in on. 
Question? Yeah. Uh, in this case, yes, it's a gene ontology term, but it, it's a, in general, I like to think of it as a pathway or gene set. The reason I'm asking is because this morning you said that the gene ontology, that the gene ontology is where nested. In yeah. Gene. So when you say this is the, whatever, EGS pathway, which pathway? So, so this might, this might um, include all of the terms that go up. Usually, uh, as Quaid mentioned, we filter the sizes, so we don't have um, uh, terms that are too big or too small. Um, so I can't remember what we used in this paper, but it might have been 300 genes. So we wouldn't find all the top-level terms in gene ontology because they would have thousands of genes in them. Um, so we eliminate quite a bunch at the top that are very general. The reason we, remo we remove that is that they're often so general. Like if I get a pathway coming back that says biological process, what am I going to do with that? It's too general. So by removing it, we increase our interpretability and we decrease our multiple testing penalty. So each of these is actually interpretable. Maybe if I go through any of these, I may find 100 genes that are all related. Yeah. And there's not a lot of overlap of genes between. Uh, well, there still could be overlap, and that's what the green lines show. Um, but uh, um, at least we've grouped them together so that you know the ones that are related. So. In the tool that you can use um, uh, during the lab, uh, you can click on these nodes and you'll see the genes. Um, and you'll see it's interactive, so you, you'll see. I'll show you in a sec. Um, the example. Are the, and you can click on those as well and you can see what those genes are. And you can see the heat map. If you have gene expression data loaded, you can see the heat map view. Um, yeah? So the green lines says how many genes are yes. shared? Yes. The thickness of the green line shows how many genes are shared. Any other questions? So, is it always A versus B? If you have like A, B, C? You could have A, B, C. I'll show that in the next case. Uh, so here we have um, two uh, time points. So this is um, actually four different, you know, it's A, B, C, D. So it's uh, A and B at 12 hours, A and B at 24 hours. So each one, each time point, we did uh, an, an enrichment analysis, uh, treated versus untreated at 12 hours, treated versus untreated at 24 hours. So we got two GSEA results. And then we wanted to compare them. And so we used, cited, we used the visual properties in Cytoscape that I told you about to show um, this, where the, the center of the node represents the early time point, the color of the center of the node, and the color of the border of the node represents the late time point. And um, what you can see here is that the many of the pathways are up and down at both early and late. However, a couple, like in particular this ubiquitin-dependent protein degradation, is white in the center and red at the, at the border. Um, and that means that it's not seen at the early time point as differentially expressed. And at the late time point, it's highly differentially expressed compared to in treated versus untreated. So the nice thing about this now is, again, it's very, it just provides a very quick visual uh, summary of the results. In this case, two different pathway enrichment analyses. And I can very quickly identify the parts of it, like here, uh, here, there's, there's some that were found at the early but not the late, and here's uh, late but not early. So very quickly, if I was interested in seeing the difference between two time points, I could just quickly see which pathways are uh, uniquely changing. Um, and in the software itself, you don't get a view exactly like this, but if you click on the node, you get a heat map, and uh, you can interpret that further. So here, you can see that um, this protein degradation pathway um, at the early time point is actually both up. It's up in treated and control. And in the late time point, it's down in treated and uh, up in, con in control. So the treatment reduced protein degradation, and that's why it's coming up here. So. Um, the last uh, use case is uh, getting at this idea of the master regulator that I told you about this morning. So um, the, uh, in this case, we took a gene, public gene expression data where somebody had knocked out a <coughs> microRNA in the heart and in mice. And um, so they collected gene expression data with the microRNA present and with the microRNA knocked down. Um, and uh, 
we created an enrichment map which shows a whole bunch of pathways go up around the, all these red ones here and a, and a few pathways go down. So you might expect, expect a lot of pathways to go up because microRNAs are negative regulators. So if you remove the negative regulators, everything that they're repressing might go up, right? Um, but we wanted to see, to get more insight about the mechanism that this might, you know, why, how the, the microRNA is linked to these pathways. So we took um, the microRNA set, the set, sorry, we took the, the set of predicted targets of the microRNA from target scan, which is a microRNA target prediction system, and we created a set of genes with all the targets of the microRNA, the predicted targets, and we represented that set as another node, this little triangle in the middle here. And um, the uh, and then we used a query set analysis or post in, post uh, analysis we call it in the tool to uh, create additional uh, edges between this set and the other sets. And what we can see is and these are now pink lines, and the pink lines show that there's genes in common between the known target or the predicted targets of the microRNA and pathways. So what you can see is that there's a lot of no, there's a lot of predicted microRNA targets in some of the pathways, but not others. So none of the downregulated pathways have that. That's kind of a good positive control because that's what we would expect. But not all of the upregulated pathways have tar microRNA targets in them, only, only some of them. And some of them are much stronger than others. So this gives us some insight um, into the mechanism. This microRNA might be controlling certain pathways directly, and other pathways might be going up or down indirectly as a result of the microRNA control. Uh, well, it, it we would um, expect if the if you knock down the microRNA, oh, sorry, yeah, right. Does so that make in sense? This in this experiment, yeah. Biology, you Correct. Yeah. yeah. Gonna... Well, I mean, there's no targets of the microRNA in the downregulated pathways. Right, but there are interactions between the other. Correct. Pathways yeah, so it's indirect. So it's. Well, right now we're not considering predictions of how they, you know, how the effects knock on after that. Um, we're just working with one step, which is the microRNA and its targets. So you could further look at the data um, using inf uh, analysis that we'll cover in day three, in the morning of day three, to look at transcription factors and, and things like that that you might be able to see. Um, you know, microRNA regulates a pathway that has a transcription factor, and then that regulates some other things. So you could do that type of analysis. Um, here's an example of a, of a uh, same thing that we did with a transcription factor. Uh, Veronique uh, and Shahina, um, who was, uh, 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 is a biostatistician that we worked with, um, uh, were able to do something very similar with transcription factors. And this, there's a paper here. So you'll get these t uh, slides so you can see the references. And this is what we used to create this autism map that I showed you in the beginning. Um, in the autism map, we use gene ontology and pathway databases, uh, KEG, NCI, and Reacto. And this is six years ago, so we have uh, uh, better pathways now. Um, but the number of gene sets um, we had, if we used all of them, we would have had 14,000. Um, if we uh, filtered, and this is a quite liberal filter, five to 700 genes, usually we do five or 10 to three, four, or 500 genes. Um, you get 6,000 pathways. And if you limited it to just the ones that have copy number variants that you can actually test, it was 3,500 pathways. So this is actually you know, a lot of pathways, but it illustrates the point from this morning that there are fewer, once you do the filtering, there are fewer pathways often than genes. The enrichment map software will be covered in the lab, so you'll be able to try it out. Um, and again, the idea is that you kind of get a global overview of what's going on. You can select something of interest and zoom in on it to see uh, instead of looking at the pathway level, you can go down to the gene level, and you can even, in Cytoscape, look at gene interactions and look at the actual expression data on those interactions. We don't have all of this automated, and we're still working on that, but it's possible to do it um, you know, yourself. Um, so there's, a, there's software that you'll cover in the break. And um, Ruth Isserlin, uh, this next slide reminds me to acknowledge Ruth Isserlin, who is in my group, who uh, programmed the original enrichment map paper, and when she presented at lab meeting, she baked an enrichment map cookie because um, she was she she liked uh, the tool. So, um, okay, so uh, that's um, it for right now. Um, in the next 35 minutes, uh, or however long you want to stay, we're going to go over the enrichment map. 
Um, we've actually worked with the GSEA team to put enrichment map in GSEA. So you might have noticed there's an enrichment map button in GSEA. If you click it, you'll get an enrichment map from GSEA. But enrichment map is useful for any type of enrichment analysis. You can download G-Profiler results and load it up in enrichment map. Enrichment map doesn't do your enrichment for you. Um, it, it takes enrichment results from whatever enrichment tool you're using and visualizes it inside Escape.